No, he's, no, he's, yeah, no, yeah. he's going. <laughs> We started out as a family farm. We knew that we wanted to grow food for our neighbors. We're living in the south end of Albany, which is the USDA terms it a food desert neighborhood. Uh, we prefer to talk about food apartheid because deserts are natural phenomenon, and you know racism in the food system is very unnatural. We're talking to our neighbors about it. We got a lot of encouragement to start a farm and then to do doorstep delivery in that neighborhood. So that's how it started. There was demand for training programs that were culturally sensitive for black and Latino folks. So we kind of developed that. So I feel like we're very much in conversation with the movement and in conversation with our community. The movement for black lives is very much about ending police sanctioned violence against our people, against black and brown people. So we know about police brutality and murder and we know about mass incarceration. That's all over the news and it should be. It's really important. But a lot of times what falls away from the conversation is that you know, the top five killers for black and Latino people in the United States are diet-related illness. And that's not accidental. There's all these policies in place that are state-created that cause this disconnect between black folks and good food. And similarly, over our history, our access to land has very much been influenced by U.S. policy, USDA discrimination, by violence from the Ku Klux Klan that targeted black landowners. In the early 1900s was the peak of black land ownership. In the 1910 census, um, black folks owned and operated about 14% of U.S. farms. And that was, you know, at a higher percentage than we made up in the population. And so there was a long time throughout history when the most likely occupation you'd find an African-American person would be farming, and now that's the least likely. Many of our people have confused the oppression that took place on land with the land itself. And so there's a lot of ancestral, almost cellular trauma that's associated with wild spaces and with land. The truth is that we do all belong to land and we have a right you know, to belong to land and reclaim agency in the food system, but there's a healing process that needs to happen. And part of that is knowing our history. It's not so much that we are like stepping into this white good food movement that this has always been our movement and that history has done its best job to alienate us from land and to tell us that we don't belong and it's not our story but it's always been our story. And so it's been important for us to you know find those anecdotes and evidence of the strength of our people related to land and uplift them. You know Fannie Lou Hamer's cooperative movement is you know now everyone's talking about cooperatives but that's not new. You know she was figuring out how to pull money to get kids into college and to buy a new tractor and to pay per people's burial expenses and share land and share barns, you know, a long time ago. And, and maintain the plant too as you're yeah, going. Yeah, clear the whole, okay. all the lower leaves. Well, somebody's getting in here and eating this stuff. So our programming has grown a lot faster than our capacity to manage it. So when we have uh, apprentices here or when we have training groups here, they literally sleep on the floor of our house or camp out. And then when it rains, the camp out people come and sleep more on the floor of our house. So we are trying to expand our infrastructure so that we don't have to turn anyone away who wants to learn how to farm and, and you know, work for food justice. So this is our latest project. We did a crowdfunding campaign. We're two thirds of the way there. Our new apprentices will be moving in in April and that's pretty much when the programming season starts. So we have a few months to, to make it happen. You know, it's a program space and a sleeping space for folks who come for Black and Latino Farmers Immersion. For our, uh, we have a program next year for white folks who are interested in undoing racism in the food system. So we have a lot of programs, and there's you know a need for comfortable, warm, you know, dry space, and so that's what this area is going to serve. So 
we want to be not just environmentally sustainable, but really a model of financial solvency and sustainability and justice as well. So we only do direct marketing to families. We do a farm share program where a family joins. They call it Netflix for vegetables, right? So a family joins at the beginning of the season. They make a commitment to us that they're going to participate for the you know, entire 22 weeks. We make a com commitment to them to give a fair share of like beautiful, healthy vegetables delivered to their doorstep. We've sort of bound ourselves together in this way that um, isn't as casual as the capitalist market would have you define economic relationships where it's like, do I want this or do I return it and let me go to the next store and shop around. It's really making this commitment to one another as human beings and also to this local economy. And so I think there's a lot that's right in that and we just have to figure out how to scale it up to first our institution, right, and then also to you know, society as a whole. So this is the east field because it's east <laughs> of the rest of the property. And we are planting cover crops in a half acre in this field this coming year to prepare it for vegetable production in 2017. So we just plant like buckwheat and clover and all of these plants that are alchemists that are able to take air and turn it into soil. They can take you know, nitrogen from the air and carbon from the air and turn it into organic matter. And that feeds and builds up the soil so that you know, the following year it will be ready to plant. So Wendell Berry has this amazing quote, uh, when people ask you what you grow, tell them your main crop is the forest, which you will never harvest. You know, I think it's really important that we see reflections of ourselves in the movements that we're part of. And so I remember in my earlier days of deciding to start a farm, and there wasn't a lot of publicity for the farm. Maybe there was one article that someone had written, you know, today's black farmer doesn't look like what you think. You know, this young woman of color, not this older, weathered, you know, southern black man. And I got this call from a woman in Boston who I didn't know, just a cold call. And she said she just wanted to hear my voice to know that it was possible. Because she's a black woman who had encountered a lot of discrimination and obstacles in trying to become a farmer. Not just from the white world, but from her own family. Like, how could you do this? go backwards essentially is how it was seen and she was completely in tears because she just needed to know it was possible. You know I'm really influenced by my ancestors included my adopted Hebrew ancestors so the Talmud teaches us that um, you know, not to be overwhelmed by the grief and despair of the world, that we're not obligated to finish the work, right? But we are obligated to always take a step in the direction of completing the work. <laughs>